this is Ed Weiser, Reef Weiser on uh, Reef to Reef, and I'm with uh, Todd Willard, uh, T. Willard on Reef to Reef, and we're starting a new uh, series on uh, on cyanobacteria that that Todd has been working with, and we want to get in this segment just what is cyanobacteria and its basic life cycle. So you get that part in, and, and in future episodes, we're going to talk about the different treatments and methods and I guess the old hocus pocus part of the whole thing. So Todd, you want to take it away? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> so cyano, um, as people refer to cyano, um, is actually, it's actually a, a single cell uh, bacteria um, that, uh, that, that, that thrives readily in tanks um, under under the correct conditions, it's um it's a bacteria that uh, it, it, in essence builds chains within itself. So this is where the problem becomes, and and uh, they not only um, have uh, thycoloid cells within the membrane that lives off light, as everyone a lot of people know they 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 do live off light. Um, and they, they form together by a, uh, a, a mucous membrane around it, and that's how the chain is held. And um, um, the bacteria itself is a, is very a simple organism. It's very simple. It's not complex. And, um, and there's, there's other things involved in its survival. Um, so... That was one thing I really wanted to point was um, the survival of the cell itself. So from there, um, it's uh, lighting, uh, nutrients, and uh, and elements in tanks that people can't even uh, measure on standard test kits. So that's that's how these things can survive um, under the the normal situations that people attempt to do. So um, I don't know I don't know how else how further to get into it without getting into real scientific uh, uh, names and terms. Mm -hmm. Now, do you find that um, cyanobacteria is easily introduced into the uh, people's aquariums or is it harder hard to introduce or that how does how does one get that in your aquarium that's a the basic element we have and that's and that's a very interesting question because this is something i've been working with um for a while now and that's a huge question is how do we get it um i've had people tell me well it's natural um, which it, it you know it's a natural bacteria um, throughout the world, but uh, we all start off with sterile tanks until we introduce rocks, corals, even even fish on their mucous membranes. I mean it, it's hard it, it's hard to tell or say, but I do believe I do believe uh, within this chain there is one particular cell which makes it reproduce. To another strand, and these are easily carried by frags, corals, rocks that are introduced. Um, it's it's, it's got to be introduced. Um, you've seen people with tanks that have had them running for years, and then all of a sudden they have a cyano outbreak. Well, I believe it was from an introduction. They can't see it, so they don't know to treat. So it evolves and multiplies, and and I do believe it's introduced into tanks. Okay. Do you uh, so in nature? Where where is it found in nature normally? In is in water, uh, standing water, or where would you find that in in your research of cyano and nature? Is it found in water of some type? It's it's found it's found definitely in the warmer climates, um, and um, it. Uh, in the areas of uh, high sulfur content, um, it's uh, it's it's the cause of what they call the red tide. 
Um, and uh, it's it's those warm circumstances um, in the waters that uh, that gives the nature of cyanobacteria. Mm -hmm. So sulfur, uh, sulfur is a, a good source uh, of nutrients to these sulfur, light, and warm temperatures. So that's that's what I found where it occurs naturally. Um, uh, through the the warm climate parts of our world, um, um, that you'll find cyanobacteria. And so more of a, I would call more of a not a, a stagnant water areas and such like that. Does water movement have any effect on any of that stuff, or just what? Water water movement does not affect the reproduction of cyanobacteria. Okay, um, it's. It, uh, it it breaks it breaks the cyanobacteria chains down, but it does not. Uh, water movement does not destroy the cells of cyanobacteria. Okay. Do you do you uh, does any other bacteria uh, affect the reproduction of uh, cyanobacteria in the sense that? It can be out competed with, or that, I know some people say that you, some bacteria supplements make a difference. Do you think that help helps a lot? I uh, I'm starting to see in, in my current work uh, because as I raise and, and cyanobacteria, I grow it. That um, there are possibly bacteria that can out compete or actually. Um, live off of uh, the cyanobacteria. I haven't identified what it is, but I'm, I'm starting to see that just from my growth rate that it can be slowed by the introduction introduction of other bacteria or having a higher population of them. I have not been able to identify them yet. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, I know it's uh, that's one of the interesting facts is that you know you get. Uh, you have a your nitrifying bacteria in your tank, and this cyanobacteria is completely different. And it, I don't know if it's out competing with the nutrients in the water because it gets more in in the bottom of the tank. Seems like to be that it's always on on sand beds. Is that it, is there a reason why how that behind that? And that is that is very correct. A lot of a lot of reason why you the cyanobacteria on the sand beds or the substrates or even on the rocks um, with the literature that is out there is hydrogen sulfide. They, uh, under no light, you know, un under no light conditions, they will still uptake hydrogen sulfide. And so many substrates out there that are in people's aquariums actually produce high amounts <clears throat> enough to support the life even with no light. Uh, the hydrogen sulfide I think is a very important factor as the cells don't have light, the, the thycaloids of the cells don't have the light to support the DNA but they will uptake hydrogen sulfide. Mm -hmm. And they will continue their normal routine of reproducing with hy from hydrogen sulfide. I mean, that's just one of one of the the readings that you can find, and and I think it comes down to a very firm conclusion uh, of of sand beds, um, substrates. It doesn't really have to be sand beds. It could be anything. Anything that's creating hydrogen sulfide, I do believe they will survive even in no light conditions. Mm -hmm. So they can they can they've they've adapted themselves to deal with not having light for any kind of uh, nutrients. They feel well, well. We'll just take this. You know, they're as in nature. Nature will just find a way to stay alive no matter what they have to do. So, yes, yes. Because cyanobacteria, um, for as much as we dislike it, is uh, through the researchers and all the data that's been put out, it's responsible for our atmosphere. I mean, the, the, uh, the release of O2 is, 
you know, cyanobacteria is responsible for it. So it can live in even the worst conditions. Um, it can live and survive. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's, it's become a uh, natural, it, 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 it learns, it's learned over the centuries to survive. And that's why it's so hard for people to get rid of it. They can have it in their tanks for a year or more and can't get rid of it. You know? Yes, months and months because it can adapt. Um, it has a carbon fixation that you, you really can't stop. I mean, you know, uh, you can, but it's going to take medications. I mean, you know, an actual way to actually kill the cell, but they've adapted in a way that um, they will sustain themselves for as long as they can. Right. So that's so, that's, that's the interesting part. Yeah, yeah, and and then that's what that's that's what I'm really working toward is the. Um, the requirements of survival of the particular cell um, is one of my primary goals. Now, is there um, is there different strains of cyanobacteria other than just one? Is there just one strain of ba bacteria, or are there are several different strains of bacteria that someone would say that? Well, I've got this strain in my tank, or I've got that strain in my tank. Is is it possible to have different strains of cyanobacteria, different types? So, yeah. So far, all the samples that I have received from members, they're all they're all built the same. The cyanobacteria is all built the same. Mm -hmm. uh, the cell structure is the same. Uh, the chain length is the same. It's all the same. The only change that we will see physically with as they grow and appear in these mats is the color which through the literature that that can be read the color is dependent on the type of lighting that it receives um, the, the the thycaloids that supports the DNA um, is uh, very adaptable to the lighting so you'll see red cyano, you'll see blue-green cyano, you'll see green cyano. It's all based on the uh, on the spectrum that those thycaloid cells are receiving. And mostly in our marine aquariums, we see we see more of the red spectrum because of the lighting that we have on our tanks. And, yes. And whereas yeah. in most of the times when you see it in in freshwater tanks, because of the more white or yellow light that they use on their tanks, we see more of the green uh, cyan. Yes, it, that's where you'll see the green cyan. Mm -hmm. So they're very, the, their color is very light dependent. Um, their color has nothing to do with their their carbon fixation or, or their, their sulfide uptakes. It's really dependent on the lighting. Mm -hmm. um, the way these cells are made, they, they, they know how to how to make the best use of the light that's available. Okay. And um, so when you think about bacteria, you always think about, you know, it, it has some kind of a, a life cycle uh, involved. Is there a life cycle to cyano? Uh, does it have a, does it, or does it just keep continuing on forever? Or how is it, how is it handled in that way? So far in uh, my in my reproduction of cyanobacteria cells, I have found that um, they will they the chain itself will get a certain length, and then it kind of breaks off. You'll see it. You'll see it. It, it kind of breaks off and starts a new chain. They just they just keep reproducing and, and until they're either in a situation where um, the flow itself, uh, any flow, they get so widespread that the flow takes those extra chains off into the water column and, and, and disperses it through the water column. Um, but otherwise, they just keep reproducing. Mm -hmm. in, nature, in nature, how does the red tide go away in nature? I mean, we hear about red tides sometimes in, in news broadcasts and stuff. 
uh, in nature, how does that resolve itself? Do they have you read anything about how they resolve it in, in nature? And that's a, that was a, that was another thought I had is well, we get these red tides in nature, but they always seem to resolve themselves. Um, I'm not sure. I haven't done enough reading on the on the natural part of cyano in in the natural settings to identify how this red tide goes away. Right. Um, um, I have read that uh, cyanobacteria could eventually just disappear on its own. But at the same time, I've I've known people that have had cyano for you know upwards of a year and not get rid of it. Mm-hmm. So I think it's all about natural um, solutions. I think I think in nature it it takes care of the bacteria strain itself. The sign of I think it takes care of it in more of a natural way. Just haven't I just haven't been able to read about the source or the the biological function behind it in nature. Yeah, yeah, it's something you always uh, think about is. Uh... I always think about is what is the natural solution or natural predator or the natural uh, element that can help us understand and get a better grip on uh, controlling the bacteria in our tanks. Yes. Yeah. And, and another point um, I, I'd like to bring up <clears throat> on the natural aspect, um, as even as I, uh, a cult- I culture it here um, in my own tanks, um, if that cyano reaches the surface of the water, you'll see it'll die. The top layers will start to die, and it only grows out. Um, so it's an, that's another thing that uh, I've been noticing is, is as it rises to the surface, that layer, that top layer, dies off. But the bottom layer and the outside keeps growing. Mm. So... It may be in correlation with nature as that red tide gets to the surface of the water that it dies off naturally. I'm not sure if it's just from exposure to oxygen or exposure to carbon dioxide. Um, it's a, I think it's an exposure, and um, and I, I'm interested to know more, more about it. I just haven't read up far enough yet of how it dies at the surface. Right, and, and what it, it doesn't come up and just ring the whole surface of the tank. I know you have your grow out tank behind you there. Is that is that where you keep most yeah. of your most of your experiments in that tank? Yes, that uh, that is where I actually start my cultures of cyanobacteria. Um, amongst other things I that I study, I, I actually grow them. You'll see it here in the background. Um, um, I I uh, I culture. Uh, Dinoflagellates, uh, cyanobacteria, and flatworms. So these are other studies that I do um, do on top of the cyanobacteria. (laughs) Do you ever worry about like it uh, uh, cyanobacteria getting into your display tank uh, from just from that situation where the tank's sitting there? Could it ever air transfer from one tank to the other? I know you. Yeah, I don't think so. It, I think it has to be directly, uh, directly introduced by water means. And I use I use very between I, between my my test tank and my actual tank. I use very strict standards on making sure nothing goes from this tank to the main tank. Um, so that's uh, yeah, just standards to keep it out of the water. Right, because I mean that's something you. would... I would worry about, and and you've had that. You can have that problem when you're, say, breeding uh, different organisms. You can have contamination of the samples, or say, or something going from that small tank to your big tank, and causing problems over there. You know, which you don't want to do. Yeah. So yeah, I, I I had an outbreak of cyanobacteria in my display tank, which was caused by the transfer, and uh, since then I have really. Um, made my 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 protocols real tight on how I use equipment between one and the other. Right, you have to learn that lesson sometimes the hard way when you do things on either even when we talk about fish diseases and that. There's a lot of 
things you have to separate out? Do you have to have separate equipment for all these different things uh, to yeah. really keep it under control? Uh, yeah. So I think that's that's pretty much got what we wanted to talk about today is the bacteria itself and dealing with mm -hmm. how what it is. So everybody kind of knows that it's this bacteria that that has certain parameters that it has to live on. Uh, yes. And yes. Uh, so in our future talks, we're going to talk about the different ways that we can control the cyanobacteria, be it uh, a, uh, a bacterial uh, type uh, addition or a, uh, a pr hydrogen peroxide or all the other different chemical ways that uh, we have that, that they've come up with fiendish ways of getting rid of cyanobacteria in your tank. And uh, that's where Todd's working on trying to find out the best way and what works the best. And we, so we're not, everybody's not fishing around for crazy ways of doing it. And, yeah. and, and we, everybody can get it cured in their tank uh, easily. And that's what our, our main goal with this series is to understand and uh, give everybody a good understanding of cyanobacteria. Anything else, Todd, you want to talk about it, it say is about it? Is that pretty much it? Boy, I think it's covered. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to thank you for spending time with us today, and uh, I hope when we see, see you next, we'll have some other great things to talk about. So We'll, we'll have many great things. Right. So thanks, everybody. See you all soon. Bye-bye.